first. What is a fertilizer? Well, broadly speaking, a fertilizer is anything that you put onto your soil or spray on your plants that increases its fertility or productivity. One of the most age old fertilizers is just animal manure. It was something that was widely available to most farmers for most of time. They could just take it, toss it on their fields and presumably up their yields. Something that many people like myself still use in their gardens. But in the early 20th century, a process was developed that unlocked a scalable way of synthesizing nitrogen for fertilizer. Also explosives later on in World War I. By the mid 20th century, synthetic fertilizers were being used extensively by both large scale farmers and homeowners interested in keeping their lawns green and their veggies popping. But no fertilizer was so effectively marketed to home growers as miracle Grow. These guys were crushing it throughout the 50s and 60s, and by the 70s, miracle Grow was basically a household name synonymous with fertilizer. And now, it wasn't just marketing that got this company off the ground. These guys had a product that delivered. Use it on your plants, and you'll see them perk up and grow faster than your neighbor who's not using it. So let's take a look at what's inside one of these bottles of plant food. On the front of the bottle here, it says, shake and feed all-purpose plant food, contains natural ingredients to feed microbes in the soil, kelp, earthworm castings, feather meal, bone meal, nourishes above and below the soil, feeds for up to three months. This one pound bottle covers up to 30 square feet. Again, great marketing here. They're keeping it simple while also appealing to the microbe savvy gardener. And then on the back, they even have a little breakdown of this process. Contains vital micronutrients to grow stronger, vibrant and more productive plants. And it says microbes break down natural ingredients into nutrients that support root strength and development, which increases water efficiency. Finally, use anywhere, in ground and in containers, guaranteed not to burn when used as directed. For a beautiful garden all season long, reapply every three months and water regularly. We'll pause here and come back, but let's take a look at our organic fertilizer and see if there's any similarities or differences. Here's the front of the bag, it says, True Organic Multipurpose Plant Food 545. This stuff has the CDFA organic input seal and is OMRI listed for organic use. And then on the back it says, use all around your garden for abundant organic fruits, flowers, vegetables, herbs, and foliage. True Organic Multipurpose Plant Food is blended from natural and organic ingredients used to make fertilizers for America's organic producer growers. I apologize to my international audience, maybe you won't find this. It says, the ingredients are proven to be extremely beneficial for both plants and soil, including seabird guano, shrimp shell meal, and crab shell meal, poultry manure, and soybean meal. Plus, no sludge, fillers, or additives. And then we get over into the percentages. So here, let's break down the rules, the basic rules of nutrient analysis that fertilizer companies have to display. First of all, the big three nutrients always come first. Any fertilizer label has to show the guaranteed analysis of their product's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium composition, or NPK. Bear in mind that these are the most important of the nine essential macronutrients, but they're also still only three of the nine essential macronutrients, not to mention the eight other essential micronutrients. So on the front of the organic fertilizer, those numbers that we saw earlier, 545, refer to the NPK. 5% is nitrogen, 4% is phosphorus, and 5% is potassium. On the miracle Grow bottle, we have to look a little bit harder to find the NPK ratio. We can see in this text box on the back that its guaranteed analysis is 1248. So quite a bit higher in nitrogen content and a little higher in potassium than the 545 in the organic stuff. Again, we could stop here like many gardeners probably do, but there's a bit more nuance to the numbers than just the percentages. And trust me, this one is really gonna matter. One quick thing I wanna point out is in regard to water-soluble nutrients and water-insoluble nutrients. Really simply, water-soluble nutrients just refers to nutrients that can be delivered via water directly into a plant via its roots. Whereas insoluble forms refer to nutrients that need to be pre-digested in a sense by microorganisms in the soil and then delivered to the root zone for plant uptake. You can check out our Soil Biology Explained video if you want more on this, but essentially, one of the microbes' primary roles in the soil is to engage in a nutrient exchange with plant roots where they deliver plant available nutrients, and in return, they get energy in the form of root exudates. Really incredible process and really vital for soil health since microbes also engage in tons of other processes. It's really important we feed the microbes in our soil so we can have long-term plant health in our gardens, better soil quality year over year. 
I'll stop there. So remember those ingredients on the front of the miracle Grow: kelp meal, earthworm castings, feather meal, and bone meal. All natural ingredients. Thing is, fertilizer companies don't have to say how much of each ingredient they're actually using beyond the macronutrient breakdowns. In other words, it's going to be challenging to know exactly how much of those ingredients actually find their way into the bottle. We get a hint though when we look at the nitrogen content breakdown. And bear with me here, I know we're going to get into the nitty gritty a little bit. Maybe that's what you're here for. Underneath the total nitrogen, we get to see three forms of nitrogen that make up the 12% ammoniacal nitrogen, urea nitrogen, and water insoluble nitrogen. And then we look at the ingredient list that these nutrients are derived from, and we see polymer coated urea, uncoated urea, ammonium phosphate, and then our feather, kelp, alfalfa, bone meals, and earthworm castings, and then other more raw form chemicals that comprise the rest of the nutrients. So what exactly is the difference between urea nitrogen, ammoniacal nitrogen, and water insoluble nitrogen? Well, the first two you might have guessed are immediately water soluble. When nitrogen is water insoluble, it means that nitrogen is locked up in an ingredient, in this case, feather meal, as they indicate in this impossibly small print. That insoluble nitrogen is the stuff that our microbes get to break down. Remember the natural ingredients that feed microbes in the soil. Yep, that small portion of feather meal, along with the even smaller amounts of kelp, alfalfa, and bone meal are the snacks that the microbes get to process for our plant to uptake. This feather meal derived nitrogen that makes up 0.63% of the nitrogen found in the bottle along with the polymer coated urea are what my miracle Grow is calling slow release nitrogen which keeps plants from being burned and gradually incorporates nitrogen into the soil for the plant to use throughout a three month feeding window as the polymer dissolves. Let's go ahead and take a peek at our organic fertilizer now. When we take a look at the total nitrogen at 5% 1.25% of that is considered water soluble and the remaining 3.75% water insoluble. Now, why might that be the case? Well, when we look at the ingredients the nutrients are derived from, we can see that it's only poultry manure, soybean meal, guano, sulfate of potash, fish bone meal, crab shell, and shrimp shell meal. Now, with the exception of sulfate of potash, which is mined and minimally processed, all of these ingredients contain some amount of nutrients in an insoluble form, which again means that the microbes get to do the work of breaking down the proteins, fats, shells, minerals, before the plants can uptake the nutrients through their roots. Which brings us back to the drum I'm always trying to beat. The fact is, both of these labels are misleading in their own unique way. miracle Grow is correct when it says that it's an all-purpose plant food. It's largely supplying plants available nutrients directly to the plant without need of the microbes. What's misleading is where it says that it contains natural ingredients to feed microbes. There's a teensy percentage, sure, of some of the meals and worm castings, but we don't actually know the quality or even the amount at the end of the day. And the vast majority of the nutrients that the plants are getting are coming straight to the main line. The reason this is problematic is that when plants don't need microbes to deliver nutrients, the microbial populations atrophy and greatly reduce, resulting in loss of all the other beneficial processes that microbes engage with in the soil. On the organic fertilizer package, it says nothing about microbes, even though that's who most of the ingredients are for. Of course, the poultry and seabird manures contain water-soluble plant available nitrogen, but we're still providing the majority of the nitrogen in the form that is water insoluble, aka needing to be processed by the microbes. So it's kind of like the organic fertilizer is appealing to conventional growers who aren't microbe savvy, and the miracle Grow fertilizer is throwing a bone, a hollow one, but a bone nonetheless, to those of us who know we should probably care about the microbes in the soil. That's just my best guess. Now, which of these do I use in my garden? Plot twist, neither. There's a bit more nuance that we'll come back around to, but as far as what I feed my plants with, I really try to avoid feeding my plants at all. I'm really focused on feeding the soil biology so that they can feed my plants. But there are a few exceptions. However, none of them come in a plastic package from Bimark. Instead, when I apply nutrients to my plants, I'm doing so in very specific ways. And several of the nutrients that I am supplying my plants with come in the form of fermented fish amino acids, and some homemade vinegar extracted calcium acetate and calcium phosphorus. If you'd like to make these yourselves, I put links in the description to some PDFs you can download that'll walk you through the basics of getting started making each of these. But essentially what we've got here is 
a water soluble or plant available form of calcium acetate or calcium phosphorus. And then in the fish amino acids, we have a really wide spectrum of gently extracted pre-digested nutrients. This contains some NPK as well as iodine, selenium, iron, zinc, and other trace minerals, along with a host of beneficial enzymes and fatty acids. The main difference though, between the way that these store-bought fertilizers are applied and the way that I'm applying these homemade ones is the amount that is used. With FAA and WCA and WCP, I'm only applying tincture level amounts to my plants throughout the season per application. So to get more specific, all of these are diluted in water at a bare minimum of one part input to 500 parts water. So you know, quarter of a teaspoon in a gallon of water. Very little amounts of these are actually getting applied to the plant leaves or watered into the plant root zone. The reason for this is because the primary uses are actually to stimulate and regulate plant metabolic functions, along with providing very small amounts of nutrients for both the plant and the microbes out and about. Again, the goal is not to supply bulk nutrients to the plants, as is in the case with our store-bought fertilizers. The goal is something closer to biomimicry, which is a fancy way of saying we're just nudging our plants in the direction they already kind of know how to go. The goal here, as is the case with any natural farming technique, is to feed the plants in a way that our natural ecosystems feed their plants, just a, in a bit of a sped up way. We pre-decompose the fish so that its nutrients can be reintegrated into the soil. One final liquid fertilizer that I still use is Jadam liquid fertilizer. These days I don't incorporate it into my plant spraying schedule as much. I mostly reserve my Korean natural farming inputs for the foliar maintenance sprays. But Jadam liquid fertilizer or JLF is incredibly simple to make, really a set and forget anaerobically fermented all purpose or customizable fertilizer. And I use this primarily as a soil drench as a way to prep the ground in advance of planting. It can be applied foliarly, but because it's so stinky and I have my other inputs, I tend to not bother with it so much anymore. However, if you're looking for a fast way to swap your synthetic or organic fertilizers out for an easy homemade liquid fertilizer, you can whip up a batch really anytime within a week or two. Young Sung Cho, also provides very detailed nutrient composition breakdowns in his book, Chitam Organic Farming. So you can get that book from Amazon if you'd like, or you can check out our free mini course right here on YouTube that's designed to get you started making your own natural liquid fertilizers. Now there are a few other pre-packaged pseudo fertilizers that I use as a way to prep soil. One of them is azomite. This just provides the soil microbes with a wide range of micronutrients to process. And then I use kelp meal, but only really as a food source for microbes in the setting outside the soil itself, specifically when I make my aerated teas. Kelp meal feeds fungi, so it can definitely be a valuable supplement to have it around. I also incorporate small amounts into my potting mix recipe and I feed some amount to my chickens. I just mix it in as part of their homemade feed and it gives them a nice nutrient supplement. If you wanna get started making your own KNF inputs, you'll wanna check out our video on the five easiest recipes that you can get started right now. I cover making fermented fish amino acids and calcium acetate and phosphorus along with a few others. Thank you for watching this video and we'll see you in the next one.